What's up everybody, I'm Brad Dollar and this is What It Was Like Working With Night Ranger. What's up everybody, how's it going? I'm Brad Dollar and welcome to my channel. It's great to see you. Today we're gonna do a little storytelling. We're gonna do a little time traveling and talk about what it was like working with the one, the only rock sensation, Night Ranger. Night Ranger usually gets associated with like hair metal and like rock bands from the 80s, and that's definitely true. But they've also had an impact on pop music over the years. If you've ever played Grand Theft Auto Vice City, you've definitely heard this band. And if you've seen that new movie Air that's out on Prime about the Michael Jordan Nike story, they're also featured in there, which by the way, I got my jays on for you guys, for you sneakerheads out there, okay? to get my 80s going for you, which is basically what this band embodies, is just some of the best pop rock sensibilities of the 80s. Whether you know you've heard this band, you've probably heard this band. So without further ado, let's get into this whole story. And if you haven't by now, I'd really appreciate if you hit that like button and hit the subscribe button. I'm a little channel, but I'm trying to grow this thing. I'm trying to reach more of you. I got a lot of stories. I've worked in a lot of records and especially some situations like this where I worked with the band when I was really young, I've learned a lot and keep drawing from those Maybe you'll pick something up from this that'll inspire you to like spin off and do something different. And well, I've been yakking, so without further ado, let's get into it. I'm gonna drink some of this water. So the year is 2012. And around this time, I had been working with Bob Weir, The Grateful Dead. I kind of fell in to uh, being an engineer at the studio he was building called TRI Studios. And I've talked about that here on my channel and the amazing experiences that I had there that I still continue to draw inspiration from. And the whole essence of that space was that Bob was making records there and you know recording there and practicing there and rehearsing there but a lot of times he was out on the road too so there was a lot of like gaps in time for people to come in and a lot of bands would come in and make a record and also do like a live performance because the space was set up to facilitate kind of like everything. Uh, there were hookups for cameras everywhere. We had a huge media rig. We had a editing room for video and like live streaming before it was just something you could put on your phone. We had like servers. The thing was like crazy. In addition to being like a full stage and a full like high-end analog recording studio with like tape machines and API vision console. It was like the work. So bands would come in on tour like Night Ranger and basically make a record in front of people and kind of just capture all of that content, capture those special moments and do it in this really cool space where it sounded great, was really easy to get the sounds that they were used to and then make something really high quality they could share back with their fans. <gasps> so that's kind of the backstory for like why they were there and kind of what happened and how Night Ranger even showed up at Bob Weir's studio and how I even happened to be there in the first place. So I was a staff engineer at the time on the credits for this record uh, that we're gonna talk about. I was an assistant engineer and uh, just, you know, just luck. Uh, again, you gotta back luck up with like showing up and being responsible and delivering good work and all that kind of stuff. But just right place, right time. And it was awesome to get to work with Night Ranger, having like learned a lot of their riffs when I just started playing guitar when I was a kid. People who got me into music, got me into like Bay Area rock and metal, like that was one of the bands I got shown. So it was really cool to have that moment uh, actually uh, getting, getting to work with them. And backing up one more step to that. So once I was at Bob's, the whole reason we got connected with Night Ranger in the first place, and I'll just tell you, a, Quick funny story, I think it's funny, was we bought Jack Blades, the singer and bass player's Studer tape machine. We're already in possession of Bob Weir's Studer tape machine. We were looking for two. We wanted to do 48 tracks, 48 tracks of analog tape, baby. That was the goal. And so we wanted to get another machine. Uh, this is before Reverb existed. So pretty much all you had was like eBay and Craigslist. And there were some like resellers, of, of course, like throughout the nation. But Jack Blades had a machine for sale and it used to be the Backstreet Boys machine. It was like lived in Miami and like had a bunch of like tenure and history. It was just a rad thing was well maintained. So uh, myself, Mike McGinn, who also worked at TRI Studios. Fixing on the, you know, gremlins. It's all gonna be good. You know, something's always wrong. <laughs> and uh, AJ Santella all went on this adventure to Jack Blade's house out in like, just, I don't even know, somewhere deep in the hills, winding in this rickety truck. I'll try to show some photos of it here. Uh, I could tell so many stories about this truck. My God, uh, we call this the party truck. Wow, okay, that's another video. We'll definitely talk about party truck uh, and everything, but this truck was really special and it always came with stories. Whenever you drove this truck, you knew you were going to get a story out of going somewhere and doing something in this truck. So definitely, first of all, we tried to pull out of the driveway and we found out that the gas line had been cut, the tank had been drained. So before we even left, we're like gaff taping the, the tank and the line, making sure the gas stays in there and that we can actually just even get there. Made it there. 
think the tires were probably splitting and balding. That's fine too. But we got the tape machine loaded up. It was in really good shape. Really hadn't thought through how to keep that thing strapped down. We didn't realize really how heavy it was. Like a Studer A820 tape machine is like a heavy beast and it's like bottom heavy. So once that mass gets moving, any direction it's like it's gonna keep moving they're big they're just giant washing machines and so uh, we were driving and we just heard like something snap in the back one of the straps snap and this thing just kind of goes rolling and we didn't hear a crash necessarily but we knew we should slow down and hop back there so Mike McGann is just in the back holding that thing against the truck wall making sure we get it back to San Rafael where the studio was at and uh, we were a little worried that maybe it would have some issues but that actually ended up being one of the strongest machines we had in the building and uh, really worked great so anyways fun story so that's how Night Ranger even showed up on Bob Weir's radar so with all that backstory let's start talking about the actual record 24 strings and a drummer which is also a DVD and live performance you can watch online and I'm actually gonna watch it here while I'm talking to you guys because uh, I think uh, it can jog some memories for me that I'd love to be reminded of and uh, share share with you and you can go back and watch this too you can check it out on Amazon you can watch the video I think there's some like links on YouTube you can watch it as well but it streams on Spotify and Apple and all those things like that so definitely check it out it's a, it's a cool record and I hope that uh, once you hear about how it was made maybe you'll want to go uh, take a listen so big thanks to Night Ranger for making this possible for me to even be able to like talk about uh, this music for having the experience in the first place so thanks guys so the performance record concert live stream dvd is called 24 strings and a drummer and you'll see that it's a bunch of stringed instruments and one drummer and if you're into like the mtv unplugged kind of vibe if you've ever seen like the nirvana unplugged or anything like that like this is totally like that where an electric band is taking something that's definitely electric music and playing it acoustic now good songs always stand on their own acoustic most great songs start acoustic on piano or acoustic guitar or something like that so you'll see like that some of the songs on this record like they're the stronger ones are like oh i get why those are hits but nevertheless uh, it's really fun to watch and they're having a great time on stage doing these songs as well so always good to see that always good to see a band still rocking after so long and uh, keeping at it so all right here we go I'm just gonna hit play so if you want to watch along it's, it's rolling so what was Night Ranger trying to accomplish here like what was this whole recording about aside from being a MTV unplugged kind of vibe they also want to do these songs in front of a live audience and they also want to do these songs through all of the crazy gear that Bob Weir had it's a very high definition analog studio when you think analog you think creamy and you think like punchy and warm and like there was that element of it but it was also extremely detailed and just like hi-fi it was a very beautiful sounding studio and you know I had the opportunity to work on everything when it was super new so it just sounded new and records like this Night Ranger record um, really broke in the gear in, in a good way it really um, made it come to life and, and wake it up so in addition to wanting to create like a live performance for their audience and to create this recording that's like a live recording in front of people uh, there's also a big focus on like no headphones and really working with the amount of bleed that was going on and so that dictated a lot of the types of microphones that we use now we took a lot of pride in making sure that like the microphones never really got in the shots and weren't super visible we did a lot of like special cable wrapping and try to make choices around like mic placement that would not make things so obvious that, that there was a bunch of like big recording studio mics everywhere and Bob was the opposite of this like Bob definitely loved a big C12 in his face like that's his vibe but in general one of the vibes of TRI and one of the main focuses and why people would come here is we were really good at working with like having a bunch of monitors and a bunch of PA speakers and whatnot so it felt like it was a live show but they didn't have to wear headphones if they didn't want to and they could really feel like they were you know tapped into the room and whatnot now I know they have in-ears in this so it's a little it's a little different but they just didn't want to have like a traditional studio experience but still get a studio quality recording that was kind of the main vibe. Let's see what we can do to make this feel like a record, sound like a record, but we're gonna treat this like a live show so it feels like there's some heart in it. And like, if you've ever recorded live music, it sounds live, you know, it's hard to get it to really feel like a record. And that was one of the things that we did at TRI and making sure that these live recordings sounded like records when they were all done. So that was one of the big reasons why they were there. You'll see like uh, a lot of the mics are Telefunken M80s. I don't, I don't know what Jack, Blades vocal mic is like I don't know I think that's like an sure an AKG or Sennheiser I don't know drop in the comments if you know what Jack Blades is using on his vocal mic I will uh, look up and see what that is but everything else is a Telefunken M80 which is a great vocal mic uh, I got one here this one's real good <sighs> got one here these are awesome um, 
they sound great on vocals, sound great on guitar caps too, but they have excellent like rear rejection. Like they're not gonna pick up the stuff from behind it that great, which is awesome for keeping a lot of bleed out. And then they just sound really like present and full right at the mic. So that's a big uh, a big favorite that we used a lot. I still like to use a lot. So outside the Telefungans, I think one of the best mics that you can actually see on the stage is an AKG C24 right over the drummer. Uh, that's a real AKG C24. It's an immaculate shape. And using that thing as like a stereo overhead is, was, will always be beautiful sounding. It captured the full sound of the kit. I mean, there's definitely close mics on this kit you'll hear in the recording, but all of that overhead image, all of that overall kit, that's that C24. I'm sure we ran it through the API. I'm sure that's the preamp. Um, we were pretty light on overall uh, compression going in. We always ran stuff through the sauce, but like, that's the sound of just like that mic and like everything working together really harmoniously. So that's probably my favorite mic that we used on the stage and we used a lot. There's probably also some AKG 414s out for like the audience sound. And we used, uh, again, Telefunken 260s on the acoustics as well. I think we took some DIs too. We always did just like safety, but those Telefunken 260s are killer tube small cap condensers and one of my favorite all time uh, acoustic guitar mic. So really cool to see that here. All right, some of the other gear we used outside of the microphones in the actual control room. And I don't think there's any like visuals of the control room in this live performance. I don't know if you have the DVD, is there like special footage? I, I don't know. But the console that we used is an API Vision, 48 channel Vision, amazing sounding desks like super clean tons of headroom punchy like api preamps sound really good and they're my favorite but like inside of the console with that much voltage running through it mm, that thing was so juicy so good and uh you're really hearing that loud and clear that's coming through on this recording for sure that's the sound of an api we also ran everything through the studer tape machines on input now we thought we were going to pull tape for the session but after we got into it and after we got through rehearsals we were like this is gonna be like a ton of tape to even like get all of this. So these recordings are actually done like with the studios on input back into the console and then back to Pro Tools. So there is some analog sauce. Some of Jack Blade's uh, machine made it on here, but we didn't use tape. We tried, uh, that would have been awesome, but uh, I totally get why we use Pro Tools, but it's very analog in its essence nonetheless. Cool, so I think that's about all the gear. You'll also see in a lot of these shots, you'll see like uh, the live sound setup as well. There's a really rare Crest Gamble live sound console in the back of the studio and you'll see the one only Chris Shiruki running it. Uh, rest in peace, uh, Shiruki, amazing monitor engineer, road manager, stage manager, uh, Passed a few years ago, great human. You'll see him in a lot of these shots running that back desk, but that thing sounded awesome. One of my dreams someday is to get that desk or one like it, because they are recording ready. The, the preamps, the EQs, the headroom in those live sound consoles are amazing. And so that's what they use inside the room and it makes a difference. Like it's, that's not a Mackie running the sound. Oh, boom, the sound in the room. I couldn't forget this. All right, so I totally almost forgot this and this is probably the coolest, best and most important piece of gear when it comes to the surroundings of making this record possible. And that is the Meyer Sound Constellation system that was installed in Studio One, is installed in Studio One at TRI Studios. And basically what that is, is a room modeler inside of an actual room. So like it would just make whatever space that you wanted to hear inside that space. So you wanted to be like a big cathedral. It sounded like a big cathedral and not fake, like you just had like a reverb unit running. It sounded like psychoacoustically, like the space got bigger, like the ceiling got bigger, the walls got wider. And conversely, like when you'd make a smaller space, like it would suck in and everything would feel like the room itself was very small. Now with the constellation system off, the room was like dead dry, like no life, just like there's nothing in it. Like almost, I don't wanna say no reflections, but just like, just kind of, <laughs> the room itself just kind of sound like cardboard. Just like, just to be honest with you, just like cardboard. But as soon as you turn the system on, like it sounded like whatever you want it to be. And our favorite setting was one that was modeled to feel like, you know, an old Capitol uh, studio or just an old like power station style studio. And like everything's like wood and like a perfect reverb time. And we use that a lot. We could really play with that. And we put the mics in those different places and, you know, really kind of capture that overall room sound. So all that to say, like the room itself is probably the coolest and most important piece of gear when it comes to like these TRI, Bob Weir, Night Ranger performances. And Night Ranger loved it. I definitely think that was a big part of the experience they had was feeling that and hearing themselves so well and why they could get away with like just monitors and playing acoustic and feeling good. I mean, like go look at 
photos of this band currently touring right now, like they're not messing around. Like they got the full rig to pull off their sound. So for them to do that acoustically and to feel good and for this, you know, this record to have energy and to feel awesome like this is, it is rad. So that's kind of the overall essence of the cool gear in there. The room is definitely a big part of that. The API console, the Studer tape machines, all the microphones, just really cool to get to work on all of that gear and getting to work on gear like this uh, is a really big highlight of my life. And if there's anything that you can take away from these experiences, it's like, I'm going to share with you what it was like to actually make music on that equipment. And I think it's important to highlight that because it is fantastic and it is amazing. And also, I know that you can also make records on other things too. You can make records with nothing but this M80 if you want. If you, all you got is that Mackie, if all you got is that Apollo Twin and, uh, and this or like a 57, like you can do it. So uh, when I talk to you about making records in all kinds of different ways and different formats, different places, like I'm also referencing like crazy productions like this, but also like, hey man, if you got a laptop and a microwave, like we got an ISA booth and a recording studio. So let's go. I'm down with whatever. But it's awesome to be able to share this with you because I know not everybody gets the opportunity to make music in big studios like this with big artists like this and that's a big part of why i want you to tap into these experiences i want you to have these experiences too i want to share them with you as much as possible so let's talk about night ranger themselves like what were they actually like to work with as people how were they they were awesome never really felt like i was just like some assistant engineer which is what i was you know really felt part of the crew i don't know if it's because they're from you know san francisco bay area we're all bay area people and we got a vibe or I don't, I don't know what it is probably not that i just think they're really solid people and i think at a certain point when you've had a lot of success and you've been around the the block a million times like you experience ego no matter what and then you let it go and you feel it again you let it go and you feel it again and i think people like this like night ranger they've been through so many different revolutions of that they're in a really great headspace and because of that they're awesome to work with also shout out to brad gillis uh brad gillis is the uh, guitar player for this band and you know really another great person to work with i uh, they say never meet your heroes i can't say like brad gillis has like been ever been like my hero but definitely like i learned a lot of his licks a lot of his riffs when i was growing up playing guitar and you know it says a lot that he was the first guy to get the call when randy rhodes died to fill in that spot so dude wales and hearing him play acoustic right there in front of me um was awesome so really really cool the band overall really sweet people um really hard working everyone was there early everyone was there late making sure it came to life also got to mention the keyboard player eric Levy. Eric is not an original Night Ranger member, but I was fortunate to meet Eric when I was really young and he was also coming up and it was cool to see him make this jump from like this keyboard player that would come into this rehearsal studio I was working at, uh, which side note is actually this place and it became Bob Weir's studio. We'll get to that later in a different video, but I got to meet him in a younger capacity of myself and then as I progressed in my career, he was also progressing in his career and now like, do you go listen to this guy play keys? Like he's awesome in Night Ranger, but like dude makes a lot of his own posts on his own. He is super gifted. One of those few people who can play whatever kind of keyboard style you can throw at him, like classical, like pop, synth stuff, like Rhodes, Whirly, jam stuff, like dude's got it all. So um, really cool to also have shared this experience with him too and to, you know, to go somewhere with people. And I think if you don't take anything else from my videos, like the best thing you can pull from making music is people and these experiences we share with one another. Yes, the songs matter. Yes, it matters to get stuff out in the world and share our, our, our art with, with one another, but making music together and having that human connection and building those relationships, that's the best part of it. Like getting to meet people and, and grow up together and then see like where their music goes and how they take off. That is the absolute best part. People are the best part of making music. And so, you know, being able to, to do this record with Eric all that time ago and seeing him still just killing it now is really great. So I could talk for days about what it was like to work with Night Ranger. I got to spend nearly a whole week with the crew making 24 strings and a drummer, but we only got so much time in a video. So thank you for watching. I really hope what you can take away from this is the goal of making music is to really make it with people and really see what it's like to put your heart into making music for people and with others. And I know a lot of us, we have to make music on our own, our own spaces, and we're alone a lot of the time, but make records with as many different people as you can. And, you know, have some goals of people and artists you want to work with. You know, when I was 12 or 13 years old, I would have never thought that I was going to work with Night Rager. And who knows who I'm going to work with from here. So definitely set some goals. And in the meantime, just be focused on building 
building relationships, making really high quality art, really high quality music, and you're gonna find your way no matter what. You're gonna find your way to opportunities like this sooner or later. So thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate you following your path. If you have questions, comments, drop them below. I'd love to hear from you. Be sure to like, subscribe, and I will definitely see you next time. So thanks so much for watching. See you soon. I'm just a nerd.